Jessica Stadden uh, is a research scientist and a privacy product lead at Google. She works on leveraging data for better security and privacy. Her interests include usability of security and privacy technology, trends in privacy-related attitudes and methods for measuring and predicting privacy-related behaviors, attitudes, and risks. Prior to Google, she worked at Xerox Park, at Bell Labs, and at RSA Labs. Um, and Jessica holds a PhD in mathematics from UC Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Stadden. Okay, thank you. So, um, so there's a lot of discussion about the privacy risks of data mining. Uh, I think it's a really fruitful discussion, but that's not what I want to talk about today. I really want to put that to the side and try and um, get some discussion going around how data mining, data analysis can actually be used to understand privacy better and really improve the privacy user experience. So, so I'm, it's a short talk. I'm just kind of going to hit on a bunch of examples. Many of them aren't mine, but I can you know, connect you with the, the relevant papers. Um, kind of two buckets of examples. The first is about un, how to understand, how to use data mining to understand what topics are sensitive. And I'll try and argue for you that um, convince you that this is not obvious and we really do need some help with this. Um, and then a natural question after you've understood what topics are sensitive is how do you know when you're hitting on a topic that's sensitive? How do you know when, you're, when a document is, is about a certain topic? Um, and then I'll just uh, talk briefly about some open problems. Okay, so, so sensitive topics. So you might say this is pretty obvious and there are a lot of obvious ones, right? We know identity is sensitive in a lot of contexts. Um, Sexual orientation, <coughs> excuse me, sexual orientation, um, uh, medical conditions, you know, all those are pretty commonly sensitive. Uh, but, oh, thank you. But um, I guess I would argue that the number of um, privacy incidents that we continue to have um, is some evidence that the obvious ones don't cover everything. So, so as an example, um, Google Street View, so the product that allows you to see you know, an actual picture of the address you're going to and you know, help you navigate. Um, that was received very well in a lot of places, not so in Germany, right? So, so the cultural differences in, uh, in, in sensitivity perception are, are pretty important and hard to anticipate. Um, another one from a couple of years ago, Quora. Um, Quora is the, a uh, question answering service. Uh, you post a question and, and hopefully other users answer it for you. And they, they instituted a couple of years ago they instituted a feature where you could see who w had viewed a question. So the thinking was this is a useful indication of um, interest in a question. Uh, but there was you know, a pretty negative privacy reaction from, from users feeling like this was you know, kind of an invasion and this was sensitive data. So, so anyway, so, so this is just an argument that, um, that perhaps automated tools are helpful here. Maybe discovering, determining what's sensitive isn't as obvious as you might think. Okay, so, so the first example I want to talk about is some work that was done on Quora. Uh, this was at um, IEEE Security and Privacy this year. So here's a screenshot of Quora, just to sort of, if you haven't seen it before, give you an idea of what it looks like. So you can post a question um, anonymously, and then when you answer it, I'll just click through all these, um, you have a choice as to whether your, your name is exposed as the answer or whether you post your answer anonymously. Um, and if you choose an anonymous route, then you're included in some sort of counts, uh, but your, you know, your name should not be exposed. So, so what the, the authors of this paper um, thought was, well, hey, maybe this is a pretty good signal of sensitivity. So if someone chooses to answer anonymously, maybe, maybe there's a reason. Maybe there's something about their answer that's sensitive. Um, so, so what they did is crawled the Quora uh, website over a few months, and you can see here all the statistics of what they pulled. And, and what they focused on is this, this anonymity ratio, which is just the number of anonymous answers that a question gets over the total number of answers. So they focused on this as an indication of sensitivity. Um, and so they did a number of things. The paper has a lot more than I'm covering here. Um, but they, one of the things they did was built classifiers to try to predict the sensitivity of the question, uh, which is basically the, you know, the fraction of uh, anonymous answers, and also just the, the sensitivity of an answer in particular, so whether or not a given answer would be anonymous. 
And you can see that over the baseline, which is the baseline is just assuming that nothing is sensitive, they were able to make some improvements. Uh, but I think the most interesting thing about this is what they were able to um, sort of describe about what makes something sensitive on Quora. Um, so, so here are you know, a bunch of you know, areas in which they found a lot of um, uh, sensitive questions and answers. So perhaps things you'd expect. So personal experiences, you know, uh, whether or not someone had done something, what was it like, uh, things about relationships, infidelity, uh, career questions, uh, you know, work-life balance, how to be successful, um, and a lot of social issues. So, so maybe all this is, is pretty, um, yeah, can make some sense, maybe it's not so surprising, but the interesting thing I think is that they found that even topics that were fairly routine and common and maybe even mundane, when they were combined with uh, feelings, with uh, personal experiences, with information you'd only have as a member of a, sp a special group, they were most likely, uh, more likely to be sensitive. So examples are, here are, here are three. Um, what are the downsides of attending Harvard as an undergrad? Um, so here, you're revealing yourself as a member of a special group, if you're answering this. Um, a social question, why do homeless people wear so much clothing? Um, and how do Zynga employees feel about the stock price drop? So again, a special group. Okay, so, so hopefully that um, suggests to you that, that there is some room for data mining to give us more nuance around what makes something sensitive, what makes a topic sensitive. Okay, okay, so, so shifting gears. So now we've got maybe some understanding of what topics are sensitive. How do we, what's the next step? How do we go about sort of protecting against um, revealing something about those topics? Okay, so, so let me just start with a couple of examples. Um, so this is an FBI document uh, that was declassified. And in the process of declassifying it, it was redacted. So those are those white <coughs> rectangles you see in various places. So, so at least looking at it, there, there don't appear to be any names. You can see in the title, it's about some family, you know, who knows what family. But there's still a lot of information left in the document. You know, we know it's a Saudi family. Um, talk about a construction magnet being in the family. Um, a lot of half-brothers, <laughs> okay. So at least at the time of the screenshot, you know, when you plug it into a search engine, you know, the first page of results are dominated by bin Laden. So, so we say, well, this is an example um, where protecting the sensitive topic, if it you know, is bin Laden, maybe isn't as easy as we thought, right? We took out the name, but there was enough information there that perhaps someone could infer it. Um, one more quick example that we'll use later. Um, sorry, this is so blurry. This is a, uh, a shot of Valerie Plame's biography. So Valerie Plame uh, was a covert CIA operative and her identity was leaked a few years ago and um, she wrote this book. And the CIA redacted chunks of it. This is actually about her first tour of duty, this chapter, um, her first tour of duty in the CIA. So, so we can't immediately tell where the tour of duty was, uh, but there's a lot of information left, right? She talks about it being very hot there, it being in Europe, uh, complaints about traffic, uh, et cetera. And at least at the time of the screenshot, the top two results were for Athens, Greece, when we you know, put in those keywords. Um, and that is indeed where her tour of duty was, first tour of duty. Okay, okay, so, so what's the problem? Slightly more formally, we're talking about a situation where we've got some content, maybe a document, um, we're giving it to somebody, many people perhaps, uh, but they don't really just have that content, right? They have some reference knowledge, they have some um, background, they have resources, they have things they can combine with the document to perhaps learn things that we don't expect or you know, don't anticipate. So the privacy challenge here is to try and model that reference knowledge and anticipate these inferences. So, so one quick way to do this, and again, I'm gonna try and keep this really high level because what I'm trying to, um, what I'm trying to encourage is talking about how to use data mining for privacy as opposed to the specifics of these, these examples. Uh, but one way to do this, to try and anticipate these inferences, is to use a knowledge corpus. Um, for example, that could be the web, like in these examples, and that's, that's really inspired by work that Marty Hurst and others have done, using the web as a corpus. Um, and anyway, use some knowledge corpus 
to take the sensitive topic, expand it to a list of related keywords. Um, and then we need to evaluate the strength of those keywords for inferring the sensitive topic. Like how closely associated are they with the sensitive topic? Um, so what we're really trying to get at there is the probability that when you see those keywords, the document's about that topic. Okay, so, so again, a quick algorithm would be just what we did with the, the search engine. Put those, those keywords into the search engine. How many documents do you get out? What's the count? What's the hit count? Um, and look at the hit count of those keywords with the topic as well, and take the ratio. So here's the Valerie Plame example again. We get 0.72. Okay. Um, so I wanted to just quickly go through one example of this that's not web-based, um, just because I think it's also a nice use case to imagine. Um, so you may have heard of the Enron corpus, which is a corpus of 500,000 or so, actually more than 500,000 um, emails from senior managers at Enron. So you can imagine a corporation like Enron getting a request for data, maybe you know through a subpoena. So for example, say they are asked for all the documents to deliver all the emails that are pertain to Wharton, for example, some entity. All right, so how do they do that? So they can certainly look for any emails that contain specifically Wharton. Um, maybe they think, okay, Wharton, it's part of the University of Pennsylvania, I, could sh I should look for that too. But pretty quickly, right, it's hard to think of what the keyword should be. So, so what we want to do is test how well this, this idea could be used to expand into a, a list of keywords that would help you catch the right emails. Um, so so in, this, in this experiment, we were using both the web and actually the Enron data set itself, splitting it in half for, uh, for training and for testing. So here's what we got, the top 40. That's, this is not super helpful as it is. Let's organize it. Um, so a bunch of Wharton professor names, um, students, a phone number, zip codes related to Wharton. Um, some other business schools, this is probably a weaker association. Uh, but then also uh, a bunch of things that we think are just not right. We can't find any association between them and Wharton. Um, okay, but here, here's an example of what we're shooting for. Here's an you know, example of success. This is an email from Francis Diebold um, that doesn't mention the keyword Wharton anywhere. Um, but uh, it is, in fact, the type of email we'd want to pull out because he turns out to be a professor at Wharton. And it does have a lot of the keywords that were you know, in our top 40, Philadelphia, uh, parts of phone numbers, et cetera. Okay, so an example of success. Um, so I just want to mention briefly, uh, these, these slides were pulled from a, re from a research talk, and I think the details aren't so, so useful for this short talk. Um, but I do want to mention briefly how the challenges around sort of evaluating algorithms like this. So typically we think about precision and recall, right? Precision being the fraction of the things that we find that are correct, and recall being of all the things we should have found, you know, what fraction did we actually find? Um, so the challenge here is that calculating precision and recall depend on knowing out of this fairly substantial corpus how many of those emails are actually about Wharton. Um, and, and we don't. So, so what we did in this experiment was we focused on the keywords that do contain, I'm sorry, the emails that do contain the keyword Wharton, and we looked at how many of those we'd be able to identify without relying on the keyword Wharton. So, and then you can see using that sort of estimate approximation of precision recall, um, here's a, a curve with precision on the y-axis and, and uh, recall on the x-axis. The red square is starting with a simple approach of just looking for anything with University of Pennsylvania in it. And then the triangles show um, how, how we do using email to expand to our set of keywords. Um, the diamonds are just using the web to expand and the x's are, are using both. So you can see if we, if we use both, we're getting around 0.75 each with precision and recall and yeah. Okay, so I want to squeeze in one more example. It's not really strictly privacy related, but again, I think the more examples you see, maybe the more other things you'll think of to do. Um, so uh, same, same technique, different use case. So reviews, you know, when you look at, say, Amazon, you're, you've got a book you're thinking of buying. It's got a bunch of reviews, how to evaluate them. Um, you can look at other things the reviewers have written, um, 
there are some reputation systems, but in general it's hard to assess, like these people writing these reviews, how do I, how do I evaluate them? Do they, are they, do they have the right background to be able to evaluate this book? Do they have a relationship with the author? Could they be biased? Who knows, right? Um, so, so we did some experiments with this. Let me, let me describe, give you an example first. Um, this is a book, a very, actually a very nice book, uh, that Ross Anderson wrote on security engineering. And when we made this slide, there were 10 uh, reviews. So, okay, so you might ask this question, what, what is the relationship of these reviewers, if anything, to the author and to the subject in general? Um, okay, we'll see. Well, one of them's easy. It looks, <laughs> looks like Ross. <laughs> Ross wrote his own review. He liked his book. That's good. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. What about, what about these other folks? Uh, so Avi Rubin. So his work is actually described in the book, and he's worked with the author. Uh, Gary McGraw's interviewed the author. Stuart Schechter's work is, um, Ross has written about his work, so they, they have some connection as well and uh, Richard Bondi has you know, helped edit it. So, so not to say that that means you should discredit, in fact, in fact you might want to read their reviews more closely because they have some shared background with the author. Um, but I guess the, t the takeaway is this could be useful information in terms of deciding um, how to calibrate these reviews. So, so we can actually use the, the previous technique pretty, pretty naturally to try and pick up some of these relationships. So the, the basic idea is just that if an author and reviewer have, have worked together or have some relationship, there may be web artifacts, there may be web evidence of this relationship, right? And we, and we can pick it up by doing the same types of queries as before. You know, we can look for the reviewer name, we can look for the author name, we can look for their names together, and we can count the number of documents that we get in each case. So of course here we're very sensitive to the uniqueness of someone's name. If someone has a common name, we may get a lot of um, web pages that aren't actually about them. Uh, but anyway, so here, here's one potential way to pick up on these relationships uh, in an automated fashion. Um, and at least in the case of the example I just showed, it looks like it does a pretty good job of separating the, uh, the reviewers who actually do have a relationship with the author and those who don't. Um, and I will just gloss over quickly, because again, this is sort of more detail than we need. Um, we did some experiments with this. Um, for the case of cryptography books on Amazon, and here you can see the, the way the precision and recall were shaking out based on the confidence. Okay, cool. So, so now I want to move to some open problems. Um, and this is, uh, well, I'll get to the, the specific work in a second. Um, so so there, are lot, there are lots of open problems here. What I, the work that I've talked about the specific algorithm, of course, have lots of room for improvement. Um, for example, in the, the inference work, we're trying to model human reasoning, and we're cutting corners all over the place, right? We're not, we're not at all capturing the complexity of how humans reason and how they might make these inferences, so certainly room for improvement there. Um, but I guess what I want to focus on here is kind of a bigger problem. I think really the elephant in the room with respect to data mining and privacy is figuring out how to associate attitudes, you know, what people say about their privacy concerns, their privacy expectations, and what they actually do, behaviors. Um, so for a long time, we've kind of been relying on what's called the Weston scale for that. Um, so the Weston scale is actually a very simple set of three questions uh, that you can ask you know, a participant. Um, they're all agree, disagree type questions. I'll just read the first one. Uh, consumers have lost all, all control over how personal information is collected and used by companies. Uh, the next one's about how businesses use consumer information. Um, and the third one's about laws and, and uh, you know, regulation support for, for privacy. So, so using these questions, Weston proposed to categorize users into one of three buckets. If a, a participant answers in a privacy-concerned way to all three questions, they would go in the privacy fundamentalist bucket. If they answered in a privacy-unconcerned way to all three, that's, that's our bucket. And then everyone else ends up in privacy pragmatists. And, and one hope with a scale like this is that if you could cluster users, 
in a useful way, you'd then be able to predict what they would do behaviorally. You'd be able to see the, you know, the differences in behaviors would correspond to the differences in the, the buckets, the attitudinal buckets, right? Um, this could be hugely useful for, for service providers who you know, see the, the behaviors and don't know what that means in terms of the attitude of the user and, and vice versa. So, okay, so how does Weston do? So, um, Allison Woodrow, uh, Vassal Bahur, Sonny Consalvo, Lauren Schmidt, Laura Brandemarty, and Alessandro Clisi have a nice paper at Soups this year uh, where they looked at this. Um, so I'll explain this in a sec. What, what they did was they did a large-scale survey where they asked participants the Weston scale questions, and they also gave them a bunch of different scenarios, um, which ended with a sort of behavioral intent type question. So here's, here's a scenario, what would you do? Um, and so what you see here on the x-axis is 20 of these scenarios. And these lines are showing the average response. And so the interesting thing here is that, oh, and the color coding uh, is green for fundamentals, red for pragmatists, and I guess blue for unconcerned. So the, the interesting thing, the kind of disappointing thing here, was that except for you know, a few exceptions, in general, all three buckets are tracking pretty closely. Right? So unfortunately, it's not looking like the Weston scale is giving us uh, allowing us to anticipate the variation in, in behavior that we see. So huge open problem here of what, um, can we even do this? You know, what scale would do this for us? Um, great. Okay, I, I will stop there and um, would love to have questions. Thank you so much. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, so my question is about uh, the social aspect of privacy. And uh, I've lived, I grew up in India, and then I lived a significant time of my life in Switzerland. And there's a contrast in the social aspect of pri privacy in these two countries. In Switzerland, for example, privacy is some, somewhat taken for granted. I mean, it's, it's a very, very important issue in society. Whereas in India, you really have to seek out privacy. I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, interesting term, actually. You are looked at strangely if you uh, want privacy. And it's the, the onus is upon the person who is requesting this privacy to have that privacy. Whereas in yeah. Switzerland, you'd expect the society to respect your privacy. Do you see a similar sort of reflection in online privacy? And, uh, and following from yeah. that, I feel uh, a lot of uh, issues are about secrecy, which is a political issue, which is somehow lumped with privacy in, in, in uh, matters that are, uh, you know, uh, somewhat murky. Right. So, so uh, how, how do you think uh, that differentiates? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah, we see huge differences amongst users in different uh, areas. Uh, one example that comes to mind is personalization, right, which is sort of a privacy sensitive area, right? Um, in, in a lot of the EU, we see you know, uh, some alarm, some concern, right? There's a, it's an invasion, how'd you get these, how could you personalize it so well? How'd you get these data that you're using to personalize? Um, whereas actually, in, in contrast, I've seen data from India where it's much more positive. Um, and I don't know what, what explains that, um, but, it, but it's, there, are huge, there are huge differences and it makes it very tricky for, for service providers who operate in multiple <laughs> Um, locations. Um, your, sorry, your other point was about secrecy, meaning more sort of security and... And about, uh, they say you don't want others to find out because they can take advantage of it financially or otherwise. Right, right. I guess I would, um, I don't know if I'm really answering your, your point, but um, I think one of the, the core things that we, that, that service providers in general have to remember about that is that it's not just important to have transparency around the data, but to provide some controls with that. Um, that the, yeah, they're both, they're strengthened by working in combination. Yeah, yeah uh, wonderful talk. I have uh, two questions here. Like, how do you see uh, this uh, data mining affecting when, uh, like in Europe, Google has been asked, mm. forget, uh, <laughs> A right, to be, to be a right to be forgotten, and 
another thing is that the one, uh, this kind of thing you are discussing, is it something similar to uh, sentiment analysis that's being done, like in a commercial basis, following the Twitter feed or? Oh, interesting. Um, uh, okay. So, so sentiment analysis, and I'll answer that first since it's still with me. Um, what we did was really not saying anything about sentiment analysis. It could be extended to, to include that, right? We could certainly you know, be looking for also um, sentiment words. That'd be one easy first step um, and how closely they're associated with the topic. But, but yeah, what I showed today is sort of uh, separate, doesn't go that far. Um, Right to be forgotten. So your question was, how how could this be used to like to identify documents associated with a person, that type of thing, where I want, where I'm requesting that data be taken down? Is that what you're thinking? I mean, how that effect, like uh, data mining, how do you mine the data by uh, also respecting the right to be forgotten? Oh, 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 oh. Yo, that's a that's a very good question. Um, yeah, and I, I, th I think part of what makes this hard is, is even, even really responding to, to that request that something be taken down, right? Because uh, right now, I, th I think, I'm not involved with the, the team that's doing that, but I think it's a pretty laborious, <laughs> you know, largely manual effort. So potentially data mining could be helping with that. But given the, the seriousness of that situation, we couldn't rely, you know, purely on an automated approach. <coughs> One last question. Hello. Oh, just a quick question that for the Amazon um, Amazon author review, was it a clustering problem or? Was it a clustering? Would you cluster the author together and say who support whom? And I didn't quite understand oh, that. Oh, um, Good question. I, I don't think of it as a clustering problem. It was more um, the fact that we wanted some automated way to detect relationships right. between a reviewer and an author, and then we're, we're leaning on the web for evidence of those relationships. Oh, so you don't depend on the Amazon review, but you depend somewhere That's else. right. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, thank you so much, Esther. Thank you.